Excellent. Um, we are uh, pretty much on schedule, and I guess I would invite uh, Chris Roop to come and join us. Um, Chris will be helping to finish the draft um, statement of the pension and OPEB problems. And uh, so if everyone has their document from last week, do you have another document as well? I do. I'm going to pass out a handout that might inform some of the conversation around numbers. Um, these are charts just to show everybody what the drivers of the growth and unfunded liability have been every year from 2007 through the end of 2020. So, um, and, and I welcome any factual corrections that, that the treasurer's office offers. These are from a slide deck that the treasurer presented to one of the trustee boards several months back and the information comes from the valuation studies. But I just wanna make sure we're counting things the right way because I sometimes in this draft use a different time frame than what's in the charts, but this way everybody can see the impacts that different things have had over over time. So I want to take one pass and keep all the extras. All right. So good morning, everyone. Uh, for the record, Chris Roop, Joint Fiscal Office. Um, I please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we ended the conversation at the top of page four under causes of unsustainable liabilities. Um, does that sound right to everybody or did I skip ahead? Anyone jump in on that? Page four sounds correct. Great. So I'm happy to do this however you all would like. Um, I can pause, you know, feel free to interrupt me or whatever, no, no pride in authorship here. And I uh, wanna make sure we can get this done in as painless a way as possible. So this page starts off with the section of sort of detailing at a high level what some of the causes of the, the liability growth has been in the course, across the course of the current 30 year closed amortization period. So unsustainable annual increases since 2008 in the amount of the total unfunded liability, the ADEC, and the state's total cost to retirement contributions, including retiree health care benefits, are rooted in a variety of experience, economic, and demographic factors, including underfunding pre-2008. The state underfunded the VSTERS, that's the teacher, employer retirement contribution in all but four years from 1979. That should be to 2000, through 2006, not to 2008. I apologize. I did not catch that when I was doing my first review. Although this historic underfunding occurred prior to the closed 30-year amortization period and is not responsible for the significant increases in liabilities subsequent to 2008, it added costs to the ADEC and contributed to why the teacher pension is a lower funded ratio than VSERS. Does that make sense to everybody? Is that a, yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, I felt like the second part of the, uh, that paragraph shortchanged the impact a little bit. It didn't affect the liability curve, but it certainly has effect on the assets curve which influences the delta between the two non-fund lines. Um, so it didn't affect liabilities, but it did affect the amount of fund funding liabilities. Well, that, that shows up in the ADAC growth. So the ADAC makes up for the lost assets, at least in theory. Right. That's the point of the ADAC. Correct. The point of the ADAC is because legislatures and governors back when I was in grade school um, and, and beyond, uh, made poor decisions about fully funding the obligation. And the point of getting onto an amortization schedule is to take care of the previous underfunding. Um, and, and so I think, I mean, I think it's important for us to recognize that, that part of the reason we're sitting here today is because the liabilities have grown since then, and and uh, and we need to figure out why. What if I could offer maybe a clarifying suggestion on the language? Uh, maybe after the the term ADAC, add the phrase to make up for lost investment opportunities in the past. 
Sure. Um, I think one of the things we were talking about last time is um, adding in specifics in some different areas, um, recognizing that people that are really interested in this are going to want to read through it and want all the details. If we could add some more specific numbers um, to that paragraph, I think that'd be great. Andrew, to how it affected the ADAP. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and that may be something that we would put on the list um, for actuarial analysis, just to say, you know, for it, it had this had this underfunded underfunding not happened pre two thousand eight, um, well, you know, what 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 would the impact be to the ADAC relative? It's it's not an easy thing to estimate because so many assumptions have changed over that time period since we've been in the current amortization period. So the interest rates have changed over time and things of that nature. But we could ask them to. Well, how does that help solve the problem that we're trying to face today? By adding in more specific details? Yeah. To help inform our members. No, but we're trying to solve a problem. I, I'm just you know, act, asking the actuary to do work on something that doesn't help solve the problem, doesn't allow the actuary to do work that will solve the problem. If people aren't fully understanding the problem, it's hard to explain to them then how these changes fix a problem that they don't understand what the cause is. So by providing them with information to help them be informed, I think it can help them to see why these changes are being decided. Well, I think there's many causes to the problem. If we were to do analysis of all those causes, I think our actuary would not have time to look at the solutions to the problem. Because I can go through a laundry list of what caused this problem. And you know, you could we could spend a lot of time arguing over it. Like let's take select an ultimate, which is how you know assumed returns were. That, depending on who you talk to, cost us hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, so I, I mean, we can go through and do that. I just I think we do have to make a decision as a task force about whether we want the actuary focused on solutions or going back and looking at how we ended up here. Um, if I could, I would offer that it may inform the solutions. Uh, in that if we know what uh how that uh, driver that uh that impact affected the adec um we can match uh recommendations to that amount for example it strikes me i know revenue is a, is a tough uh tough solution but underfunding came from not paying for services uh, that should have been paid for or uh, not raising revenue that should have been raised. Uh, so it, it seemed like an equitable uh, match to take that amount and look for revenue to uh, make up for that shortfall. Well, then should we take the $300 million that VPIC lost because of their poor decision to go to select an ultimate? Where do, we, where do we place that? Should that come from revenue? Should that be cut from benefits? I mean, you can have these arguments forever and ever. I just really don't see where that gets us. Peter. Just a question regarding actuaries work and how long it takes for them to actually do what we are asking them to do. I like the backwards plan. And if we send the actuary, I need you to, to uh, to determine this, I need to determine that. And we send it to them on Thursday, but we met Wednesday. That's the turnaround time, typically. Not one day. <laughs> so, so, so I'll, I'll look to, to Michael to, to sort of color in the lines. But my, my limited experience dealing with the actuaries is it's really important to prioritize what you want them to work on. Um, and so there's not a whole lot of back and forth, um, you know, about, well, what about this? What about that? It's good to give them a request all at once. It's also easier to say, Generally speaking, tell us what would happen if we did this, like in the future, rather than ask them to work back toward a number. So, um, you know, the, the work can be very complicated and, and very time consuming. So, uh, you know, just in, in, in the past, when we, when we asked them to model some scenarios around changes to plan design, I think the turnaround was about a week and a half and that to two weeks, and that was on a aggressive timeline. Two to three weeks, then, in all probability, per question. And if we give them a, a substantial list of questions or, or our options, it could.
could be longer. I, I, I think the more we ask them to do and the more time it takes, you know, the more time it takes and the more expenses incurred. So there is, you know, I, I, we're not the only client they have and, and everybody, every pension system around the country is likely working on their actuarial valuations right now because um, most people are on the same fiscal year cycle. So um, yeah, I would not, I would not want to create the expectation of immediate turnarounds on the work or that um, we're going to be able to, to answer, quite frankly, every every question that could come to anybody's mind. Like we are going to want as a group, I think, to really prioritize what we want them to look at um, and, and try to get them as much of that all together at once as possible. So there, so that sort of minimizes the back and forth. And so, and please jump in if I if I missed anything. No, I think that's so not true. Just, that's it. a final comment. Given given that we are very time constrained in, in our work and what you just said. It's, uh, I don't know if we're going to be able to get the type of information that, that you have asked for, and at the same time, get the information that we need to make decisions. You know, nice to have versus must have, where there are two different things. Right. And, and perhaps we don't have the actual numbers, but I know I've heard from multiple people concerns about underfunding, and a very short, brief paragraph about it probably doesn't answer all of their questions. And I think. We heard last spring that lots of people brought up the fact of what about the underfunding? What about the underfunding? And by giving them more information to help them understand the impact of that, I think that will help to the, get them to the point of okay, I, I can understand that point that you're making now. I think it helps get them on a similar page as we are. Um, and ultimately, if this is a document that we want to put out to people that are going to be impacted by this decision, so shortchanging them on information about something that they're really concerned about and brought up numerous times just seems wrong. So we're on our first um, of, of, of a long list of causes of the liabilities. And so I'm wondering if maybe we can um, flag this as something where you would like to have a little more detail, mm -hmm. perhaps not perhaps we don't have agreement on whether we want to go as far as sending the actuary in to investigate um, this uh, and come back with with you know what we can determine to be really precise numbers but I guess I would like to suggest that we go back to the list and then have a discussion when we're through all of the um, all of the liabilities and 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 maybe have a conversation then about where we'd like to see more information and maybe Chris can help us understand what it would take from his perspective to, to put more specificity into the ones that we feel need more details. That sounds good. Yeah. Peter, did you have anything else? Uh, oh, sorry. Just, yes, I've read the document somewhere. I can find it in an hour again <laughs> to, to do it where it indicated that in 2008 after or maybe it was six, seven, whatever, after X number of years of decisions that the, 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 um, the unfunded actuarial uh, yep. liability was X. Mm -hmm. And then compare it to, we've now had a run from 2008 to current year where the ADEC has been fully funded and that, that Unfunded liability is now why, and just and put those in there just to show you know where they are because the, the sort of a lot of other actuarial assumptions that, that the unfunded liability is closed and it's, it, you can't you have to blame everything you can't blame everything. Right, and, and that, that's an excellent point, Representative Fig. And that information um, is in both the Treasurer's January 15th report, and I believe in her testimony here a couple of weeks ago. And sort of the raw data that informs that question is in the handout that I just distributed um, that we'll make sure Commissioner Pichak gets. But that shows you, if you sort of take a look at, you know, a, a point in time, you know, the, the end of fiscal eight or whatever, and, and then work your way you know, just add your way down the columns year to year, and it will show you how um, all the different factors contributed to the growth in unfunded liabilities since then, at a time when we were fully funding um, the, the ADEC. The one thing I do, the sort of asterisk I would put on that is, you'll see there's a line on the teacher chart that says contribution shortfall, including retiree health care. That's not failure to pay the ADEC. That is the impact of paying the OPEB costs um, out of the corpus of the teacher pension fund, which was a practice that ended uh, back around 2015 or so. So that has that has the actuarial impact of sort of a, a contribution shortfall. But you can also see that um, you know in, in terms of the overall percentage of the growth in liabilities, 
um, it, it was a relatively small contributor in the big picture. I wouldn't say 150 or 175 million dollars is a trivial amount of money, but the liabilities have grown much bigger than that. Yeah, Kate. I, I was sort of deciding whether or not I should say anything at all, but I do want to um, respond to something that John was saying, and uh, in response to Andrew's request for information, which is that if we talk about um, how is that going to solve the problem, I think the problem really comes back to the fact that we don't have a common understanding of the problem and that it's one was sort of written for us that we don't necessarily agree with. And so when we talk about solving the problem, I don't think everybody's understanding of what the problem is, is the same. Right. Which and is I also think it's difficult to have this conversation when there's so much um, what, what's coming across as uh, frustration and, and some hostility as well. So let's see if we can finish the list that is in front of us and then let's plan to um, come back to talk about how we would like to um, enhance a, this statement of the problem so that we're putting together a document that, uh, that we think speaks to our constituencies and uh, and is a fair representation of the contributing factors. Does that make sense? Super. All right. We'll take these one chunk at a time and have a, you know, have a discussion um, uh, recognizing that when we get to the end, uh, we'll have a better sense of sort of the sum total and we can reflect for a few minutes on how to, how to how to change what we have in front of us. Thank you, Chris. All right, next bullet point is Great Recession. The dramatic economic downturn in 2008, 2009 created a hole in each fund that remains unfilled as of the end of FY20. Actuaries in 2009 estimated that it would take more than 20 years of the actuarial investment rate of return of 8.25%, which was the return in effect at the time, to get back to the FY 2008 funding level. From the beginning, of FY08 to the end of FY20, investment performance falling short of assumptions increased the VSER's unfunded liability by 340.9 million and the teacher unfunded liability by 417.1 million. And those numbers come from adding across the columns in the chart I handed out. Are there any questions on that? I would just make a, well, I guess I'll pose it as a question. Um, it would take more than 20 years at the actuarial investment rate of eight and a quarter percent to get back to 2008. But most um, pension systems around the country did not, in fact, achieve anywhere near an eight and a quarter percent rate of return, which is what that uh, uh, supposition was based on. Um, which I think will be reflected in, in other bullet points here, but also I think contributes to, um, to the overall hole that we're in and the fact that the hole has gotten larger instead of smaller despite meeting our ADEC payments. Yeah, I would agree with that statement. And, and the you know nationwide, most large pension plans, including ours, have actually reduced their their actuarial assumed rates of return over time. So um, many plans were above eight percent around the Great Recession. Um, the investment horizon has changed. The market environment has changed since then. So not only have um, few uh, consistently achieved a rate that high since then, but most plans, including ours, have actually lowered their assumptions. So, so they assume that they would be um, receiving a lower uh, investment rate going forward than 8.25%. We're now at 7%. Okay. Which may be a good segue into the next section, actuarial rate of return. The systems previously adopted actuarial rates of return that proved over time to be overly optimistic. When a higher rate of return is adopted, the systems assume that assets will grow over time at a higher rate, leading to lower required employer contributions into the pension funds. In 2008, the then actuarial investment rate of return of 8.25%, approved by the pension boards of trustees and the Vermont Pension Investment Committee, was higher than the rate of return experienced. As of the 2009 report, 
the approved rate of return was equal or lower than the rate used in all but one of the New England states and was higher than the rate used by 75% of plans in the US. As in most states, Vermont's approved rate of return has been on a downward trajectory in recent years, most recently lowered from 7.5 to 7%. While a lower assumed rate of return is more likely to be consistently achieved, it leads to higher employer ADEC costs to make up for the fact that less of the money required to pay benefits is expected to come from investment gains in the future. Yes, sir. Just a comment, if I may, I'll, I'll, this will go to the doctors and the Yale as well. Uh, just uh, re with respect to the investment rate of return of 8.25%, I just want to make sure and clarify the distinction between um, the assumptions and actual performance or experience. And that assumptions are used to estimate a plan's future benefit payments and their present value do not determine outcomes. Um, as the actuary noted, uh, Siegel noted, that in the investment return assumption does not affect the performance of the fund nor should an actuarial assumption dictate asset allocation or investment policy, just to clarify so people understand the, the difference between an assumption and, and actual experience. Because um, sometimes those things get intertwined or confused. That, I, that's a really helpful suggestion. Other uh, questions, observations, Eric? Um, it's just a small technical question. Um, the third bullet point, it reads, as of the 2009 report, the approved rate of return was equal or lower than the rate used in all but one of the United states. It, is that true or should it be equal or higher? Because the second part of that, that sentence kind of says we're using a higher rate than most plans in the US. Yeah, we'll, we'll double check that and confirm it. I need to go back to the 2009 report. Uh, thank you, Chris. I, just to make sure my understanding or the intersection between fully paying the ADEC over a period of time <clears throat> and having these assumption returns that weren't necessarily met, or these higher assumption returns that weren't necessarily met. You know, we were fully funding the ADEC, but in actuality, because of where our um, investment assumption was, we were really underfunding it for that period of time. We should, we should have been paying more in because the assumptions were, the, the assumption was rosier than it turned out to be in reality. Yeah, no, I think that's right. And, and you know, the, the ADAC, all of your assumptions inform the calculation of the ADAC. But, you know, what, every year when they do the valuations, they'll take a look back and see, all right, how did our assumptions pan out over the last year? And if there's deviations in the assumptions, and most of the deviations we've seen have added cost to right. have, have increased the size of the unfunded liability, that means your future ADACs are going to go up. If you had, you know, a blockbuster year and you exceeded all of your actuarial assumptions, when all else is equal, your unfunded liability will decrease beyond what you thought it would be, and then your future ADACs would be lower. So that's sort of the interplay: is the ADAC is like the payment, if you will, and, and the payment depends on how big the balance is right. um, from year to year and how many years you have left to pay it off. Teacher health benefits paid from pension fund. This is what I was mentioning earlier on, on the chart. The state paid the teacher retiree health benefits, OPEB, from pension assets at an actuarial loss until 2015. This practice added approximately 155 million to the VSTERS unfunded liability since the beginning of 08. Any questions on that? Yeah, can you just clarify what years did that start in It was it predated the current amortization period. Do you know how far back? I do not. The treasurer's office may know, but I do not know. I also had a, I, I also wanted to ask, I, I had noticed that that wasn't in the background information and it's here in the causes. And I'm sort of curious about the interplay of background information versus causes and what, what those matters I don't necessarily have a um, idea of a solution. It's just something I'm noticing. Mm -hmm. So, because when you when you read the background information, if you know a couple things that aren't there, then you ask, wait, where are those things? Like, where where is the decision of you know, 2010 or 90 introduction to the thesis, for example, in the background information? Well, it's not there. Is it going to show up somewhere else? It's just something I just think to put a cross reference. Uh, yeah, and I, I think that the discussion last week was to put sort of a timeline of of the various changes in the background section. And this is listed where it is because this was a, a cause of why the unfunded liability grew from 2008 
to the present. Right. Yeah, I think and, that uh, information kind of is causal too. It's just curious to me. Yeah, I think I think we ought to consider whether we should create another chapter in our in our report that goes into a little bit more detail about changes that have been made. Um, because the, the rule of 90 is one of those, the taking OPEB out of the teacher uh, pension system is one of them. Um, the, the impact of early retirement incentives that may be sort of a patchwork of different incentives across the state because of different um, school districts uh, is something that's worth uh, recognizing and expressing, um, and you know, we could do a similar, a similar discussion or statement of of that of retirement incentives on the state system, but they tend to be more consistent because it's either going to be your your troopers or your state employees' um, retirement incentives, and, and a little bit less variable, I would imagine. Uh, so you know, I guess we should flag things that we want to go into more detail on in subsequent chapters of this. Um, other questions, observations, suggestions, Peter? If we're working with that since the beginning of 2008 at the end, this does not help us to understand exactly what that means. My recommendation is to put your statement about 2008 to the present time, uh, probably following 155 million. And then I would also add at the end um, in 2015 it was changed to pay up. Yeah. Or pay as you go. Once it take up pay as you go. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Other observations, questions, statements? Okay. All right. Back to you. Page five, demographic and experience factors. Differences between the state's actual experience compared to assumptions has, should be have, significantly contributed to the increase in the unfunded liability in ADEC, including changes in actuarial assumptions, changes in system provisions, salary experience, net turnover, actuarial investment loss, mortality experience, retirement experience, and disability experience. And again, these tie back to the chart I passed out earlier where you can see um, the numbers from year to year. Uh, what those numbers show is the, the, math, the, the dollar term impact of deviations um, between experience and assumptions. Are there any questions on this section? Sir. Uh, again, just thinking about it, I would love to add in there more clarity about what each of these mean. Um, thinking that people are going to be reading through this. Um, um, you know, if somebody reads net turnover, I'm sure they're going to wonder what does that mean? Salary experience, what does that actually mean? A short definition of each of those. Mm -hmm. We could do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. More examples. Yeah. One or the other, that would be, but both would be great. Yeah. Yeah. And there, there are some graphics from the um, experience studies that if anybody has um, some time and, and their free time. Uh, it's very interesting to look at the experience studies because it actually kind of visualizes what, what the assumption was, what actually happened, and what the proposed change in assumption was. So, you know, that helped me understand what this concept of net turnover is, which I sort of explain and, you know, did, did people leave when we thought they would leave at the ages that they left for reasons other than retirement? So like net turnover has been the biggest demographic factor um, on the teacher side. And what that basically means is we thought we would be losing more teachers before retirement and in fact, we've had more people stay until retirement. So the workforce behaving um, the way you thought it would or, or not um, drives these numbers. It all comes down to what did you predict and how accurate were your predictions? I just wondered if um, we talked a little bit about demographics in terms of student numbers and how that affects the number of teachers needed. And I'm wondering about that on here, if that's another bullet point. I'm partially wondering about it because I'm curious about the future. I think Vermont is on an uptick with population, and I wonder how that's going to affect um, 
you know, it's, it's the, yeah, right, right, yeah. and our and our um, discussions yeah. and our plans. So I, I wonder if it should be on there, right? Because right, certain of the demographic factors um, were were perhaps not able to be foreseen, you know, or, or at least not maybe not recognized as the extent of their impact, but a shrinking population of school age kids is going to result in a shrinking uh, number of teachers in the workforce who are paying into the system. Um, not sure where that fits, but I do recognize it as um, uh, an observation that we should should express because while the state workforce has remained le relatively level relatively. or in slight increases with a few blips along the way, um, the teacher workforce has definitely declined, um, shrunk. Eric? Uh, one uh, small technical question again, and then a comment. Um, actuarial investment loss is included in the demographic and experience factors it's also delved into um, above so i didn't know if we really should include that there or that that's separate you know from some other so i i would i would say uh, that's a good point actuarial investment loss though is how did you how did you perform relative to your assumptions so i think earlier you know we, we specifically highlight the great recession and the changes to assumptions but that that's the changes to the assumption is only one half of the, the, the sort of equation. The other half is how did you do relative to those assumptions? So um, I, I think this piece speaks to how well did we do relative to assumptions? And, and just again, for clarity, you know, when, when we talk about sort of an investment loss, you know, we're, we're talking about a loss relative to assumptions. We're not talking about, you know, going and making a bad, usually not talking about going and making a bad bet and actually like ending up in the negative, you know, putting 100 in and leaving with, you know, zero. It's just, you know, if you thought you were going to do seven and you did four, that 3% is an actuarial loss. So it's all, it's all really relative to your assumptions. Um, very rarely have we had years where, we, where we've had negative um, investments. And one other thing to point out on this subject is, you know, VPIX numbers and the actuarial numbers are slightly different just in methodology. So when VPIC measures their, their investment performance, they take a look at their, how their portfolio do, you know, over the course of the, the fiscal year. Um, whenever the actuaries do the number, they take an average of the balance of the previous year and then see what your growth was. And then, you know, th they'll, they'll calculate the percentage that way. So the fact that they're taking an average of the account balance and not sort of strict start and end point is why you sometimes see some deviations in the percentages between what VPIX investment reports say and what the actuarial valuations say. Thank you. That, that's, that, that's a good explanation. As to why that is a little bit why that's different from above. Um, and my comment on this question that I had in the document really dovetails well with your suggestion, Sarah. Um, that we, not in this section, but further in the report, we may want to delve into some of these drivers in more detail because they do uh, influence what what options are. Other observations, questions, suggestions? All right. Okay. And then from the beginning of FY08 to the end of FY20, demographic experience deviating from assumptions increased the VSERS unfunded liability by 290.4 million and the teacher unfunded liability by 268.3 million. That was adding across the columns and in, in sheets that I distributed to you earlier today. Um, similarly, investment performance deviating from assumptions increased the VSERS unfunded liability by 340.9 million and the teacher unfunded liability by 417.1 million. And that includes the impacts of the Great Recession. All right, they like two paragraphs to go, so I'll just wrap them up. Actuarial assumptions have also been revised over time to more realistically mirror anticipated demographic and investment experience. These assumption changes, however, have also added to the unfunded liabilities. 
from the beginning of FY08 to the end of, that should be FY20, changes in actuarial assumptions increased the VSER's unfunded liability by 496.6 million, the teacher unfunded liability by 828.5 million. Again, those numbers are on the chart that I handed out earlier today. Chris, so these three numbers are added. Yes. One, one is not the, the uh, 496 is not the, the addition of the, the two bullet points. That's correct. It, 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 all, I would add all three of those together. Thank you. I will <laughs> do that at the bottom. Yes. Stay for a total you know, in this area. Yeah. Increased. Just, yeah. Just so you don't have somebody sitting there doing the math that doesn't come out, you can add one. <laughs> Right. Right. We, we could perhaps insert some variation of the table I distributed earlier today in the final document just to, to provide everybody with those details. Hey Chris, one just one comment maybe on Eric's earlier point, but like each of these sections has sort of a quantitative like impact, except for that actuarial rate of return section. But I think it is, I think it's, it's described in that paragraph there, you know, the investment but other demographic losses as well. I wonder if you can split out the investment versus the demographic and put that investment loss piece just in that discussion about the actual rate of return so you get a, a sense of what that means. Good suggestion. Sorry. So the so like you know the actuarial rate of return section, right? We discuss how we go from eight, you know, eight point two five to seven point five to seven, and we're saying that that's having an impact on the unfunded liabilities, but we don't say what that we don't just put a dollar figure to it. But there, but there is a dollar figure to it in that sort of unbulleted paragraph where we're saying that actuarial assumptions that were changed, demographic and investment experience resulted in those those big dollar figures at the end of the paragraph there. Yep. But but some of those tie back to that paragraph. Mm -hmm. So just to break those out. Okay, and then the final sentence on the page. As a result of these factors, pension costs have grown significantly faster than pension assets. And consequently, the gap between assets and liabilities, which is the unfunded liability, continues to widen. Are there any? So before we move on to a completely different topic, which is OPEB, you know, are, are there any things that jump out as um, needing to be added to this? We've 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 talked about some places where we want to flesh things out and add a little more context. Um, are there any things that are missing from this list in terms of what what might fall under the category of causes of unsustainable liabilities? Eric? I do have uh, something that I think would be helpful to include, and that's um, what's the consequence of the amortization schedule itself? Um, you know, the, the beginning payments are the, the ADEX uh, aren't adequate to cover the, you know, essentially interest opportunity costs. Um, so I think that's important because we really need to focus on, in my opinion, the adverse experience that wasn't planned and to some degree some of it was, was expected it was not the major contributor for sure but um, there's some element of you know, the, the funding ratio go down before you reach that crossover point and it, and it starts to go off it, if we could quantify that i think that i think that's yeah, we that I mean, that's a good point, and, and we may need to ask the actuaries to to give us an estimate on this because um, what you're referring to is what what people call negative amortization, where um, you know our payment schedule in the early years was not sufficient to pay off the accumulating interest on the balance of the unfunded liability, so so therefore the balance grows a little bit. Um, if you take a look back at the 2009 um, valuation, they project out what, um, you know, which is year one of, of, of the amortization period, they project out what that schedule would look like. And it would peak out at, you know, the, it, it would grow uh, to a, about the low 400 millions before dropping back down. Since then, though, the uh, liability has grown massively due to other reasons. So um, while there was some predicted growth from um, just 
interest growing um, that had, that was dwarfed by so many other factors that went into the mix. So that's why it's hard to say, you know, this in isolation, you know, contributed this much because so many other factors went in and so many assumptions were changed over time too. I could tell you, and, and I'll bring this in time for the next meeting. It's, it's mostly done, but it wasn't ready yet today. But um, I have a graph that shows you what people thought the amortization schedule would look like in 2009. And then I have another graph that shows what the payments have actually ended up being since then. And I don't think there's gonna be any surprises when you see the chart. But um, one of the things that also happened was, uh, you know, after the first 10 years of assuming that the payments would go up by 5% a year, the legislature changed that to, be, to grow every 3% a year. So um, generally speaking, the lower the annual growth rate in the payments, the less negative amortization you have. Um, we are also at the point in the amortization schedule that like after, with the 3% scenario, things are pretty much leveled off and, and the payments are now should be catching up with the interest. So that's why you see generally when you draw a, sort of a graph of what this looks like for, for the first you know half plus of the amortization period, most of your payments are going toward interest. Um, and then you really pay off the principal toward the end. Um, it's kind of like you know graduate from college and you start making those first student loan payments and you see how little your balance goes down at the outset because you're paying interest until, until the interest goes down and your payments catch up with it. But it was, you know I, I don't think by any means the, the amortization method contributed um, to the vast majority of the growth in the unfunded liability. It's, it's grown by, if we, if we were operating in the 2009 amortization schedule right now, I think we would be in a much, much better place um, than we are. The, the problem though is just grown much more over time. No, I, can, I completely agree with that. Uh, it just, it's helpful to know, okay, this chunk we did not expect. And that is really, that's, that's the issue. Yeah. Yeah. So hearing you say that and, and in answer to Eric's question reminds me that we want to put Chris on the agenda for next meeting because he does have some more um, detailed graphs that he's putting together for us um, to, to, to help answer. So Chris, while we're agenda planning for next time, um, maybe you can just let us know how much time you think you'll need and then we'll add 20% to that. Half hour. We always have questions. Half hour? Okay, so let's plan for an hour. That's not 20%, I understand. <laughs> I understand, but I suspect that we will have other questions that we will want um, more in information on and I feel like it helps to have plenty of time to slow down and ask questions and really understand how it works. Yeah, Eric raised an excellent point. Um, there's a great paper put out by the um, Boston College Center for Retirement Research, which is looking specifically at the New Hampshire pensions, but it also compares it to the Vermont teachers' pensions about amortization, about the issue you just raised. Um, it's worth taking a look at. I actually raised it with uh, Chris <laughs> earlier. And he gave the same response to me as he did to you, Eric, that oh, amortization may have had some impact on, on, on fund liabilities or some other things that had a much more heavy impact. John, can you say again, Boston College? Center for Retirement. I'll send the link to oh. Gail and okay, um, everybody can read it. It's, it's actually, for a research paper, it's actually fairly <laughs> easy to read. Okay. I like some papers <laughs> or not. All right, anything else on the, uh, the factors that we have been going through? Right. If we are feeling good, we will cruise through OPEB before we, um, before we finish our morning work. Great. So OPEB. OPEB refers to other post-employment benefits, primarily health care offered through the VSERS and VSERS health plans, which also contribute to the rising cost of Vermont's long-term retirement liabilities. Unlike pre-funded pensions, which are funded in part from investment gains, OPEB payments are almost, are almost entirely funded on a pay-go basis, a pay-as-you-go basis. The state appropriates funds annually from current revenues to pay for benefits and premiums for today's retirees as they become due for payment. The annual general fund liability has remained relatively consistent since FY19 for state employees at approximately 14.9 million, but has increased for teachers from 31.6 million in FY19 
35.1 million in FY22. While contributions and subsidy rates are codified in statute, potential recipients are not vested in the same way as pension benefits, and these benefits are not as secure for future retirees. There's general recognition that prefunding OPEB benefits would yield long-term savings for the state and more stability and predictability for retirees in the future. The lack of a formal and codified system of prefunding OPEB liabilities is responsible for $1.68 billion of Vermont's unfunded OPEB liabilities. With prefunding, Vermont can calculate its unfunded liabilities by applying the assumed rate of return based on anticipated investment performance of the plan assets over time. The pension systems currently use a 7% rate of return. Without prefunding, Vermont must use a standardized discount rate, the 20-year AA municipal bond rate. Currently, this rate is approximately 2.2%. However, prefunding OPEB benefits would require a long-term commitment of additional appropriations above the PAYGO amount to build up a pool of assets that can be invested long-term. <laughs> Further, OPEB costs can be heavily influenced by both federal health care policy and pensions policies that influence the age at which employees retire, as it is significantly more expensive to provide health benefits to retirees who are not yet eligible for Medicare. Pre-funding OPEB in FY22 would require an additional 41.6 million, and this amount would increase every fiscal year. <laughs> my comment in the second paragraph, second sentence, uh, where it states the an uh, annual general fund liability. Uh, just to differentiate from you know long-term liabilities and annual expenses, we just might want to use a different term there, the annual cost yeah. of the general fund or impact instead of liability. Yeah. yeah. Just to just to not um, confuse people with long-term liabilities versus uh, cost and expense on an annual basis. Can I just like about the writing of many things, but why why is it so different for teachers and state employees? Uh different with the, the cost rather. Oh, so 14.9 is not the entire cost. Um, that's just the general fund impact. Uh, so that's about 40% of the cost um, because OPEP is funded the same way that the v, the VSERS OPEP is funded the same way the VSERS pension is where there's a percentage of payroll deduction assessed to the active payroll. So the costs fall based on the fund that pays the salaries of the active workforce. So about 40% roughly of the state's active workforce is paid from the general fund. Therefore that $14.9 million is, is roughly 40% of the total cost. But why is it staying the same? That is a great question that I think the um, VHI and um, Central HR may want to weigh in on because um, some of this likely has to do with just differences in how the plans are structured and how they're subsidized and uh, claims history. So I, I just, I don't have an answer for you today, but that is a great question. So state employees pre-Medicare um, are re, would remain in the same state employees health care system, which is uh, a self-funded uh, insurance system, correct? And teachers are in VHI, which is a product offered by well, it's not it's not employee sponsored insurance, right? It is a it's, um, for the, uh, it's a Blue Cross Blue product. Cross product right? the, the state is self insured, as you said. But I, I also want to comment on the, the part of this that says um, it's more expensive to provide health benefits to retirees who are not yet eligible for Medicare. Um, the under 60, the, the under age 65 members of the retiree population who elected health care benefits, they are not a significant driver of OPEP, OPEP costs. And in fact, in the teacher system, the number of retirees under the age of 65 has been decreasing over the number of years. Um, and it's, it's a smaller population of people. The bulk of the people who receive health care benefits are over age 65. Additionally, um, we plan to announce later this month some uh, changes to how we contract for uh, retiree health care for the teacher system. 
um, which will have some uh, fairly significant savings, um, which will help um, decrease the pressures on that fund, um, as well as depending upon what the current administration does in Washington with respect to potentially lowering the age of Medicare eligibility, that could have a, a further um, positive benefit on um, on our current costs and our liabilities. Um, so we, at some point in time in the next couple of months, depends on how things go, we might want to maybe different numbers so yeah. with some of these OPEP costs and liabilities, particularly around well, I know for sure on the teachers' health care, potentially even for the state uh, will have costs as well. And, and one final comment on the um, on the last sentence of prefunding OPEP in FY22 would require 41.6 million in amount would increase over fiscal year. I think everyone knows um, the VSERS OPEP received approximately 52 million in additional funds as a result of the um, reform of the uh, revenues for the past fiscal year. Um, and that a significant influx of dollars into that fund, almost doubling the current net assets of that fund, and may also lower the VSERS funding requirements um, to initiate free funding. So we should look at that in that context. That's a great point. So it sounds like we have a little more research to do to understand um, kind of Good question. yeah going back to what I thought I think what I heard you say was that folks that who are teachers who are retirees under age 65 are not the driver of Correct. Is that what you said? because of the numbers so it's, what are the drivers the cost of insurance cost of insurance I think the the numbers of people are in, the increasing numbers of people um, utilizing the insurance you know we have we have increasing numbers of retirees every year. Uh, this past year, I think we had 300 plus teachers retired July 1st. Uh, you know, and depending upon how many people died the preceding year, um, I think just generally speaking, the numbers are going up year after year. The healthcare cost trends in general typically outpace overall inflation. By, by quite a bit. I think the, the assumptions that the actuaries use um, in, in the most recent GASB uh, report on our OPEP was, I think it's uh, the near-term healthcare um, cost rate is over 6%, um, the cost trend rate. So, you know, you compare that to our um, long-term payroll growth projections, you know, the CPI, which measures inflation, and um, uh, just the overall cost of, of projected increases in our ability to pay for them. Healthcare costs typically outpace those. Does that help? I'm wondering if you could also um, research for us the rate of growth in the um, state employees healthcare system relative to the teacher system, just so that we can have a better understanding going forward what we might be looking at. I mean, understanding that the portion of that on the state employee side that, that hits the general fund is relatively small, but I think we should go in with eyes wide open about what we've seen for increases in the cost of um, teacher retiree health care relative to state employee retiree health care. And and Peter has a question. Peter has a question, and then Eric. So first, um, the 41.6 million, when I first looked at this, and the, the treasurer's concept of 10%, 10%, 10%, I've looked at the 35 million plus the 15 million, just, just round against the 50 million, 10% on that is 5 million. So where's the 41 million? <laughs> so for the additional 41.6 came from a memo that the, the treasurer prepared for the legislature in early May, and that includes both plans. And that the, the increment, that 41.6, is $21 million above what was budgeted for the teacher OPEB and 21.6 above what was budgeted for the VSERS. 
And that funding, my understanding, would essentially seed the path to pre-funding. So, you know, going back to the, the advantages of starting with investing money early is if you can start um, with a little bit of money as sort of the seed whenever you start and put a little bit of cushion in as that grows over time through action, through investment gains, that gives you a little bit of a protection against volatility in the short term. So the intent here was to put a seed, seed money in first, then 10, 10, 10, and three. Correct. That was the proposal. Yeah, on the um, on the teacher. Um, I missed the sound part. Yeah, okay. it, it always helps to start with a with a slug of money to get you going, just to make sure that when you start down this path, your first few years when you don't have a whole lot of asset growth from from investments because you just haven't had a lot of time, make sure you have enough money that you can that you can start building a balance with some conservative some conservative assumptions in it. Uh, Eric, I think you had a question. Did you? Um, and sure. then Leona? Okay. Yeah, so, sounds good. Um, just to, trying to think about how these costs would play out in the long term and that um, only a portion of state employee or graduate falls on the general fund. If the state were to make the decision of pre fund, would still a significant portion of those, of that cost still? Uh, not following the general yeah, yeah, yeah. employees. So, so I mean, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, it, in a status quo situation when all else is equal, um, you know, right now everything is is assessed based on where the active payroll is. If a decision is made moving forward to continue under pre-funding with that funding situation, then yeah, that would continue. But obviously the legislature can can decide how to pay this bill however they want. But I do just want to point out that, you know, while the general fund only picks up roughly 40% of those costs, um, you know, we, we talk a lot about the general fund because that's sort of the most flexible pot of money we use. But, you know, I, I don't want to dismiss the fact that there's impact to other funds that is adverse to the state as well. You know, my my world tends to focus a little more on the transportation fund, for example, which um, th then on then on this stuff. And, you know, every additional dollar you have to pay into the, the four big long term liability buckets, the, the two OPEBs and the two um, health care or the two pensions rather, um, it, you know, is a dollar that you can't use for direct service delivery or for other things. So, you know, we talk a lot about the general fund because that's usually where we spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to fund priorities for the government. Um, but, you know, it, it does have an impact throughout the government because all these other funds, you know, none of these funds are unlimited and there's always large demands on them. Leona? So, um, Looking at your, when you did our OPEP overview and just looking at, you had the path to keep funding and all of that. So my biggest concern is we're already in a point of, we're here because the ADAC is growing, you know, sustainably. Um, and we're saying, okay, we have a mortarization schedule, but it's because of things in the past, what's been going on, demographics, blah, blah, blah. We are here to deal with that. The language of this just sort of when it says, and this amount would increase every fiscal year. When I see things like that, it just makes me think <laughs> that is very. So we're saying $41.6 million, right? And then it's saying incrementally increasing its appropriation above the pay go amount. D, and I know you said the seed money, right? But what is that incremental? What is that increase every fiscal year? Is there any way to say, what would be the amount that would be required to have this pre-funded going on in the in the future? Now, you can put $42 yeah. million dollars in there, but how much? And then will we be here? Not, well, not us, but you know, someone <laughs> be here two or three years down the road talking about, well, OPEP, we thought it was gonna do it would work with this, but now it's gone out of control. Yep. The, no, that, that is a great question. And and you know, the the Completely unsatisfying answer is nobody knows what's going to happen in the next 30 years. Um, you know, I think what what the incremental cost should be depends in large part on how you want to go about paying for this and what your amortization method would be. You know, the, the treasurer proposed a scenario with on the teacher side where you can, you know, as Representative Fagan was describing, you know, there's a series of sort of 10% annual increases and then 3% after that, you know, that's one path forward. You can also do an ADAC schedule the way the pensions do, where, you know, you basically take the, the normal cost of the unfunded liability and you calculate every year 
what you need to set aside, um, but it's going to depend on how how many years you want to to amortize the liability over, and what's your method. You know, level dollar versus level percent of payroll. What do you want your annual increases to be? And you know, your claims history and what's going to happen with healthcare costs are huge unknowns in the future. So, you know, as difficult as it is to predict the future with pensions, um, you know, the benefit formula is much more straightforward than. Um, with the OPEP situation, because you don't necessarily know what healthcare costs are going to be or what utilization trends are going to be 10, 20, 30 years in the future. So it's definitely a risk. From all the numbers I've seen um, bandied about, though, you know, with with with, with those caveats, is that in, in most pre-funding situations, you're looking at a ballpark $20 million or so above the PAYGO amount for both funds over the, the course of time. So, you know, I, I think in order to, to, to conservatively be on the path to pre-funding, you need to assume that you're going to budget probably at least 20 million above the PAYGO amount, um, you know, over, in average, over a you know, reasonable foreseeable future. Those numbers could change, they will change, but um, that would be the numbers that I, that I keep in my head as sort of ballpark estimates of where, of where sort of a good guidepost could be. Yeah, that's pretty consistent with the amortization schedule for the teachers really. Yeah. Thank you. Questions, observations, statements? Um, I would like to throw out an issue that I'd like us to uh, just sort of flag and recognize that we might want to come back to. And that is the question about um, state employee healthcare premium holidays. So because the state employee healthcare system is, is a self-funded system, they make an, they make an assumption about what they're going to need to collect for premiums from the employer and the employee and put that into a pot. And then periodically they look at what they've actually used out of that pot of money. And to the extent that that pot has grown more because utilization was lower than they expected it to be, they have an excess amount of money that, that legally they need to do something with. They can't just continue to sit on an ever larger and larger pot, right? Um, correct me if, if I'm using incorrect terms. The concept here is, is what I believe I understand. And that is that when the pot of money grows, then we have to decide what to do with it. And I wanted to suggest to this group that we consider making a recommendation that instead of a premium holiday, which goes, which basically says state employees, you don't have to pay your December premium because, you know, because we've got enough money now. That, that that would go into the OPEB system instead. And, and because you're going to be the beneficiary, you as state employees are gonna be the beneficiary of those dollars anyway. Um, and since we are trying to, to do a better job of, of putting us on a fiscally responsible path with pre-funding that those premium holidays might be better invested in, um, in OPEB. So I just, flag that for our consideration at some point in the future. Is there and, a, an idea of how much, just out of your actual work, like, you know, I, I believe we just got one yes. coming up, right? So how much yes. money is that, do we know roughly? Um, I don't know offhand, but I would imagine that Chris could ask around joint fiscal and, and they have that because it was a consideration during this year's budgeting process. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, to the extent that that the fund has more money in it in the future, we might want to make a recommendation. I can just add a comment to there if I made it. Also, goes uh, the premium holiday also is extended to retirees as well, not just to active state employees. Yeah. Yeah, that's it's a fair chunk of money. That's a, a worthy consideration. Money that was allocated for healthcare related expenses. It seems like that's, if it ultimately found its way there, that would be sensible. All right. Any other observations, 
questions, suggestions on the OPEP section? And Chris, anything else that you hoped to review with us on uh, in this document? I, I don't think so. Um, I, I think my understanding is we were going to put a pin in pages seven and eight until this afternoon. Um, please correct me if I'm wrong on that. Oh, I'm looking at a different draft. Now. We already, we already, um, went over seven, right? It's yeah. seven, seven and eight of David's um, oh, yeah. uh, other document. Con considering changes. Right. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I have a different draft because I have to have everything in one place. As you can see, I'm not very organized when it comes to paper. Yeah. All right. So I believe that that finishes what we had for this morning's agenda. Um, We flagged one issue that we'll add to the agenda for next meeting, which is to come back to Chris um, for answers to some of these questions. Um, and any other questions, comments, suggestions from this morning's work? All right. Thank you all. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Um, so, uh, we are at the point where we were going to take a 15 minute break, but we don't have um, another presentation planned before noon. Uh, so we could either um, start our, yes, Andrew. Uh, never mind, I'm looking at the wrong agenda. Um, we can start our lunch break early and give us time to go out for a long walk. Um, and then when we come back, uh, we've got Steve Klein, Stephen Klein coming in for, uh, just to, to brief us on the revenue update that um, that the emergency board uh, heard this week. And then we'll get into some of these other uh, documents that Chris has prepared for us. Sound good? All right, Senator Parent, please join us at 1.15 and uh, we will be on an extended um, lunch break and we'll see you all back here after lunch.